So I think the year was 19, 1923, and his name was Frederick Stanley Mockford. That's a great British name, isn't it? He was the uh, radio officer who was over the area of the London Croylon Airport. It was an airport that had most of their activity was planes going from London to Paris. And for whatever reason, he decided there needed to be some kind of a distress signal that would, could be used so that if anybody had a problem, we'd be able to decipher that from just the normal chatter that was going on in their radio. <clears throat> so he came up with the word May Day. And it had to be repeated three times. If it's, that's why I'm not doing that. If it's repeated three times, then people know that that is a threat, life-threatening emergency. I don't know the French pronunciation, but I think the word that it came from is actually medes, medes or medes, something like that, which just means help me. <clears throat> I'm thinking that with David, um, the young shepherd boy, prior to his becoming king, had a few days when he probably could have cried out May Day and needed a lot of help. And I'm guessing you've had days like that as well. <clears throat> so we want to think today not just about David and, and what he experienced in his pre-royalty days, but we want to think about the lessons that we have learned in our lives as well as the past can be used to help us in the present day. Now, there could be things that you learn, lessons, that don't have to be real big. They don't have to be um, life-threatening, but anything that has come is good for us to look at and to learn from, to try to see God's handiwork in everything that comes into our lives, because the truth is, He is there. And so he is a part of that. So it's kind of neat, and you probably have had experiences where, I know I have, where you've tried to do things on your own and didn't really rely on God that very much. <clears throat> and it'd be interesting to be able to trace those and differentiate the results as to how things went when I trusted God and how things went when I tried to do it in my own strength because I think there is a difference. I printed in your bullets in the verse for the week, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, and it goes something like this. <clears throat> for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, and I like the last part, to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You know, we often want God to help us in our circumstances, and that's okay, but that promise is more toward the person who is fully committed to God and who is fully trusting him. I think it's okay for the average Joe citizen to say, man, I sure hope God helps me out. I think it's a little bit more um, doable if I'm saying, and I trust God in this circumstance and I believe in you and I'm, I'm depending on you to help me. <clears throat> We're going to look at 1 Samuel 16 and 17. We're not going to touch every verse, but I will try to tell you somewhat of the story. If you remember what Pastor Clark told us last week, it was just how Saul raised up to be the king, one that was uh, selected by the people. Uh, they got what they wanted in Saul. And most at this point, most pastors will tell you, be careful what you want because God might give it to you. And that's what happened with Israel. Uh, they wanted a certain type of guy, and they got one. King Saul was, uh, according to 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, was handsome, young, and tall. When Pastor Clark brought that up last week, I thought, hmm, all the things I'm not. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, but that's what they got. They got what they got, and God rejected him because he disobeyed God. And so now we're coming to chapter 16, verse 1, and the Lord says to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? I have rejected him as king over Israel. 
fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Wow. So what happens next is Samuel says to God, how can I do this if King Saul knows that I'm going to go anoint another king over him? He'll probably come and kill me. How can I do this? And so God t tells him, you know, go and worship, go and sacrifice. So that's what Samuel's going to do. He's going to take the implements to sacrifice and worship God, and he's going to go to Bethlehem. And anybody who asks him along the way, what are you doing? Where are you going? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to worship and sacrifice. So he gets to the household of Jesse, and he invites them all to come, and he sanctifies them and, and does all the things ritually that they need to do, and he includes them in this time of worship before God, and this is really good. <clears throat> and then he starts to, before they have the feast at this worship sacrifice, he decides, I need to anoint the king first, so bring your sons to me. So one by one, Jesse brings a son, starting at the oldest one, um, Eliab, and on down, he goes through seven of the sons, and Samuel checks them out, and it's like, uh, I don't know, I don't feel it right now, I'm not into this one. Nope, not this one either. No, I don't think this one. Seven kids, and he doesn't sense any of them to be the ones that God wanted, and he finally says to Jesse, don't you have any other sons? Well, yeah, we got the runt of the litter. Um, his name is David. He's out in the field with the sheep because, you know, he's obviously not the right one. Bring him in. Let's just look at him. And he brings him in, and God places in the heart of Samuel, he says, that's the one. That's the one that God wants to be anointed king over all Israel. I imagine in unison, Jesse and his sons all said, what? David? Are you kidding me? Him? No, can't be. Now remember, because God told us this also earlier, that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so David may not have looked the part um, as the one that you would want, although he was, according to scripture, young and impressive and, um, and had some abilities but he didn't appear that way to the family members. They didn't look at him that way. Something you're going to need to remember. Everything we're going to talk about today in the life of David, because we're going to go from here through even Goliath, um, everything that happens here, Saul knows that his kingdom has been taken away from him by God. He knows somebody else is going to be raised up, but he does not know, you do, but he doesn't, that... David's been anointed to be the new king. He doesn't know that, okay? And he doesn't know it through any of these events that we're going to look at here. That's kind of important because if he knew and if he was like any other king in that era, he would have had David and his family killed and wiped out completely. So it's top secret stuff. Don't tell anybody, okay? So David um, is now the uh, appointed king and different things are going to happen for David uh, that are kind of interesting in relationship to Saul. For instance, David has as a young kid, and I think, I picture David at this time, and we don't know how old he was, but I think my calculations say he's got to be somewhere around 14 or 15 years old at the beginning of this. <clears throat> and so he's a, a young teenage kid. He's probably strong and active. I, I mean, we have grandkids in that age group. They're pretty capable. So, um, <clears throat> so I think David's capable. But he had two jobs going on at this time. One of them was he played the harp for King Saul. And that's interesting because the scriptures tell us that from time to time, King Saul would have an evil spirit come upon him. Kind of a lot of anger and stuff going on in Saul's life. And like other kings in his time, they got pretty upset at pretty much anything at the drop of the hat. If it didn't go their way, they didn't like it. And sometimes it got very significant with him. And so they started asking around, we need to do something. Well, how about if somebody would come and play the harp? You know, that's 
if you've ever heard a harp, it's beautiful. It's peaceful. It's nice. And yeah, that might work. And one of the guys in the um, inner circle of King Saul said, I know a young guy out in Bethlehem who, when he's watching the sheep, sometimes takes a harp and he's not too bad. So he told him about David. They brought him in. So now David is actually in the king's presence every once in a great while and he's ministering to him by playing this really nice music you may know we're not going to cover this today but there is one time later on when Saul does know what's going on and he gets mad and and David's playing the music but this time it doesn't solve or, or calm him at all and so King Saul tries to make a pincushion out of David he throws a javelin at him uh, and misses but anyhow in this time uh, David is able to play and it eases his, um, his ability and, and King Saul relaxes again. And so David is kind of okay. My guess is it's a kid that you brought in, he plays the music, he leaves, and King Saul pays no attention to him. He just sits there and, oh, that's nice, thank you. And he doesn't even probably recognize, if he saw him at the mall, he wouldn't recognize him, that's my point. So that's one of his jobs. By the way, something you might want to know, we're not going to go into this deeply, but the Spirit of God operated differently in the Old Testament times than what it, he does during the New Testament church era. For you and I, the Spirit of God comes into our hearts and lives when we receive Christ as Savior, and he um, baptizes us into the body of Christ. That's a spiritual thing that you don't see. Uh, he indwells us. And so he's with us all the time. Everywhere you go, you take the Spirit of God with you. But in the Old Testament, it wasn't that way. He would come upon some for certain uh, activities, and then he would depart from them. So we are so blessed in that, that we have God present with us all the time. His other job was that he tended his father's sheep. So he was going back and forth from the fields into the palace and back to the fields and and doing all that kind of stuff. But he never forgot that God was his shepherd, David. Never forgot that God was his shepherd and ministered to him directly and that he was called. David's going into the presence of King Saul knowing that David is the next king and that God is with him. But Saul doesn't know that. Well, anyhow, at that time frame, and it happened a lot. It looked like Israel and the Philistines were at it all the time. They were fighting each other back and forth all the time. And they're at a, there's a time here where there is battle going on. <clears throat> and it happens that David's three oldest brothers are part of the army. So they're down at the front preparing to go to war against the Philistines. And um, David, again, is too young at this point to march with the army and to fight in this war. So David's dad, Jesse, says to David one day, why don't you take this food and go down to where the troops are and learn about the well-being of how our son, my sons are doing. Find out how they're doing. See how Israel is doing in this. That to you and I sounds really strange, doesn't it? But remember the geography. This is a very small area of space. All of Israel is just the same size of New Jersey. Now, I wouldn't want to walk from north to south in New Jersey, but it is a pretty small state, and it's a small location. And do you remember the very beginning of the Civil War when um, Fort Sumter was attacked, and then all of a sudden, okay, now we're going to have to go to war the north against the south. And so they came together in a big field, and all the town folk got their wives and kitties together, and they dressed up, and they brought their finest umbrellas, and they set out the blankets, and they sat up on the hill, and they were going to watch this, this skirmish take place because we know the north is just going to ransack them, and the whole thing's going to be over, and this is going to be kind of fun didn't go that way. And those town folk were retreating rapidly because of all of the bombing and stuff that was going on. That's kind of what we're seeing here. They go down and, and 
Um, David takes, you know, this goodie basket with him and goes down and has food for his brothers and is going to say, hey, how are things going? Well, he happens to be there, and in chapter 17, verses 8 through 11, he hears the challenge. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will be come our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. They were frightened. Silly. <clears throat> this was a huge attack against the nation of Israel. So this giant of a guy comes out and says, why are we going to have a war between our nations? Let's go one-on-one. -on -one. I'll go against your best guy, and whoever wins, wins, and the others are subject. And the Israelites are scared to death about this. Well, it does make some sense, because if you go back to verses 4 and 5, and you start to read about this guy, Goliath, you find out that he was indeed a giant of a man. We'll talk about that in a moment. David hears this challenge, and his heart is stirred immediately. Not just with national pride, but he thinks that the name of God is being put to shame, and he's right. And in verse 26, he, he tells us about that. It says, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who's this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is this guy? Well, if you read on a couple more verses, you find out that um, Eliab, David's oldest brother, becomes very disturbed at David for making this statement and asking these questions and it says in the scripture that Eliab burned hot with anger because of what David came and did he questioned him who do you think you are and cause, called him all kinds of things I wonder if every soldier of Israel was embarrassed at the fact that they're being challenged and no one's accepting this I'm not going to do it. You do it. No, not me. You do it. Remember the old, if you're my age, remember the old commercial? Hey, Mikey, he'll eat anything. But um, hey, let's get David. He'll fight anybody or whatever. Um, and, and so Eliab attacks David. By the way, if you were to volunteer and do this and win, look at the prize behind door number one in verse 25. It says... Now the Israelites have been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. Wow, money, tax-free living, and a daughter. None of us have seen the daughter, so we don't know how good of a prize that was. But um, anyhow, it was in the uh, package that you could win. David was not so concerned about Goliath, but he was certainly concerned about God. The Israelites were all standing there thinking to themselves, we're going to get slaughtered. And David is thinking to himself, one plus God is a majority. And in verse 32, 1732, he says, I'll tell you what, I'll go. I'll fight him. And then later on in verses 34 and 35, he says, After all, I had killed a lion and a bear that had attacked a sheep and tried to steal them off. And so, you know, this is just another victim that I can go after. David felt to attack Israel was to attack God, and that was unacceptable. And he had courage, lion, bear, because of his knowledge of who God was, and his past experiences 
of God being with them. Now, I told you I would describe this, but in verses 4 and 5, it gives us a detailed um, idea of how tall Goliath was, how, what it was like. And just to, to let you know, that some of the translations can vary a little bit. So not, not a whole lot. He was huge is the thing. Um, most of them are translating and saying that he was nine foot nine, nine feet, nine inches tall. I don't know if you know this, but that's tall. Um, they tell me that Michael Jordan's pretty tall, and this would be three feet taller than Michael Jordan, if that's the right translation. Um, if, if he was that tall and he played basketball, he'd be three inches below the rim. I think he could dunk. So. Um, then it tells us about some other things. Well, if he was anywhere near that tall, it would not be hard to imagine him to weigh in at about 300 to 400 pounds. We have football players that weigh that much, and they're nowhere near that tall. His coat of armor that he wore that went from his neck down to his knees weighed about 175 pounds. He had a javelin that had a spearhead on the end, and the spearhead itself weighed 25 pounds. So that's pretty big stuff. And all of those statistics are what the Hebrews, the soldiers, focused on. And that's all they saw. In my neighborhood, when things, when things were not even, we used to call that running odds. So um, these were running odds for the Israelites. And they ran. They didn't confront him. Again, when we look at externals, any giant will be sufficient enough to make us fearful. But compared to the all-conquering power of our God, the living God, Goliath was no match. <laughs> I repeat, no match for God. Now, um, Saul, I think I lost, Saul had those rewards for him. Saul also had a suit of armor as well. And, um, I think his, David was probably, you know, a good sized guy, so he was probably about a 38 medium, but Saul's armor apparently was like a 54 long or something, it was too big for him, and it didn't work. So David elects that he's gonna go out without that, without a shield bearer, and he's gonna go confront Goliath by himself. Goliath must have been baffled as David comes walking out, carrying a slingshot and some stones. Here's this young man coming to fight a warrior, and he has no equipment, no protection, and no shield bearer. Well, let's pause just for a second here and think about something. Other people did not see David's potential. Isn't that true? Jesse didn't see it. It's like, you're going to anoint one of my sons as king? Here's seven of them. Not David. No, David can stay in the field. Uh, he's not the one you want. These are the seven good options. The brothers didn't see the potential in David. Eliab especially. It's like, what are you doing here? Why are you annoying us so much? Who do you think you are? Goliath didn't see the potential in David. He called him all kinds of names, a dog, and you're sending a dog with sticks out to fight me. But you know what? God saw the potential in David. And I'm guessing that's true for a lot of you. There's probably been times in your life where people thought, oh, well, you're not going to be able to do that. You're not able to do this or that. Um, maybe you're not smart enough or strong enough or whatever, but maybe God is behind that. And God said, I see the potential in you. No matter who you are, God has potential for you. And I'm guessing that there's very few people in the history of the world who have ever lived up completely to the potential that God had for them. And I'm not sure why that's always the case, but I'm going to say it's more on us than it is on God, that um, he has things for us to do. He's going to be with us through it, and we can achieve what God wants us to do. Well, before he knew it, Goliath was struck in the forehead 
with the first of those five stones that David picked up in the river creek there. Some have suggested that the reason why David grabbed five stones was because um, Goliath and his brothers, there were five of them. I don't know if that's exactly accurate or that's what was being thought, but I do know it only took one stone. <clears throat> now, lest you think, well, that's pretty amazing, and it is pretty amazing, but um, unless you think it's amazing and not possible, I'm going to say it is possible. Look what Scripture says about some other situations. Um, this is from the book of Judges, and talking about some pretty good, talented people. Among all these soldiers, there were 700 ch chosen men who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. I'm saying that's pretty good target shooting. Now, Haley Dull is a great target shooter. She's really good. But I don't think she can hit a hair from a distance like that and not miss. But she is good. Maybe she can. But they were talented. And here's another example. In um, 1 Chronicles 12, 2, talking about the warriors, it says they were able to shoot arrows or to sling stones right-handed or left-handed. And I don't think it means, well, Pastor Bud can throw rocks right-handed and left-handed, and that's okay. This was better than okay. I think they're talking about not just bragging, but these were skilled people. It's a fact that these were extremely skilled, and they could do that. David could do that. Uh, and he just put it right there in the skull, which, by the way, is the thickest bone in your head. And a lot of us have thick heads, but that's the thickest bone. That's why it's good for head balls in soccer. Pay attention. And, um, <clears throat> and, he, and he knocked him out. And somehow, the scripture tells us that he killed him and then ultimately beheaded him as well and then took his weapons and his head as trophies and uh, perhaps David hung these weapons up on the mantle maybe next to the lion's tail just above the bearskin rug that he had there isn't this saying something like to the victor goes the spoils and they sure did for David so the question that I would ask you is whose side are you on it's true that God will not prevent every circumstance that comes into your life sometimes even the unthinkable things happen to us just ask the early disciples stephen and all the other apostles most of them we believe were martyred and put to death for their faith and they were the they were the foundation the great foundation of faith for all of us and god didn't prevent that for them sometimes bad things happen even to you good people. Not all giants are going to go away. But there's nothing like former battles that we've won to give us the courage to face the ones we face today. Whether they're small or big in the past, they prove for us God's faithfulness and help us get through it. David's public victories were a result of his private and secret fellowship with God. That's what wins it. It's those times alone when we're in our closets alone with God or laying on our beds praying with God and trusting him. Those are the things that give us the victories in the days to come. David was strengthened by his experiences. Here's what Moses wrote, but it often feels like David could have easily wrote this from Psalm 91, 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge, he's my fortress, he's my God in whom I trust. As we trust in God, then we are setting ourselves up for victories. So here's a couple lessons that we can learn, I think. Number one, facing giants is intimidating. Gotta be honest. It's very hard. There's a lot of things that you're going to go through that are really, really tough in life. But the good news is nothing intimidates the Lord. He knows it. He can handle it. Also, going to battle is a lonely experience. Often no one can go with you. But God's always there. 
my experience is that God still dwells, maybe not in the Ark of the Covenant right now, but I know that God dwells at the Cleveland Clinic, that God dwells at the Mansfield Reformatory, that God dwells in the hallways of the Ripman schools and a whole lot of other places too. God dwells and is very involved and very active. Trusting God then helps stabilize you and I. David knew that from his past experiences and that got him through some really, really tough things. And here's the one I like the best, that winning victories is fun. Love to win, love to win. And you need to recall your own victories from time to time. Share them with people if it's appropriate to do that, uh, just so that you can build up a reservoir in your heart of trust for God. So here's a bunch of questions I want to ask for in particular. How concerned are you about God's reputation? David was. That really offended him that God was being beat up. How concerned are you about it? To the point, I hope that you don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And by that, I mean breaking the heart of the Spirit of God. And what I think breaks the heart of the Spirit of God is when I knowingly sin because Christ died for those sins. He paid the ultimate price. And for me to just flippantly go ahead and do what I want to do and have my own self centered agenda that just breaks God's heart and should break your heart as well well how much do I trust God to help achieve my goals he's involved in everything we do do I trust him or do I really lean more on my own dependency how about do I balance faith in God with confidence in myself no really we got to have faith in God but you know, so often we take off in a direction and it's all on our own. And do I really balance that with God? I, I have to learn to do that. How prepared am I to do what God wants? What God wants me to achieve at any moment. Are you in a position in your heart where if God puts something in front of you right now, you can, first of all, go to him in prayer and he won't be shocked? And second of all, that you're ready to do what God wants you to do at that moment. Because sometimes that moment comes really fast and then it goes. And if you're not prepared to act for God, it'll be gone. <clears throat> we often use words like being yielded or surrendered or open, surrendered and open to God or available to God. I don't care what word you use, just have God as an active part of your heart and mind so you can do the things he wants you to do. And here'd be, I, I just wrote out a phrase, it's sort of a prayer, but um, I'll just read it to you. It says, may God give us grace to believe him and through faith not be defeated, by, but to be victorious. And may God stir in our hearts so that we will not be ashamed of Jesus Christ our Lord. Last week, I think Pastor Clark said, and he's right, Jesus is the true and better king. Let's pray together. And Lord, indeed, we do come to you wanting to give you our full trust, our full allegiance, and surrender to you. Lord, we know that uh, in many ways, your name is being shamed, uh, on, in our culture at least, uh, whether it's by heathen that are living in godless ways, or even by believers and followers who are not living in holy, sanctified ways, not following you, not obeying you, not yielding to you. Lord, we want to confess our sins before you. We also want to lay our hearts at your altar, surrender ourselves to you. Lord, help us to grow in our trust and dependency upon you. May that all bring glory to Jesus Christ in his name. Amen.